Hi, everybody. This is David, and welcome to week seven of Educational Leadership 655, Pupil Services and Non-Discrimination with Viterbo University. This is our fireside chat beginning Monday, March 7th, and concluding here on Sunday, March 13th. Recap, terrific learning team plans for Bruce. Awesome. You examine this from an IEP lens, from a 504 lens, from a health plan lens, refer to your board of education policies, talk to your dietitians, your media specialists. What types of books and resources do we have to educate second graders, elementary students about allergies? Extremely well done. And I commend you on the work that you put into those plans. I felt that if Bruce was entering the school and this plan was shared with me, I would feel very confident that we would be meeting his needs and that he would have a very safe experience in our school. The use of photos and Im images. Some of you noted that you would have a photo of Bruce in the substitute teacher folder. I thought that was a great idea to provide that immediate context. And also in the kitchen. Those are questions that come up all well, as a confidentiality and but again, I think in best interest of the student to have those available um, for people the way that you describe made a lot of sense. Also in your trainings, have people hold an EpiPen. So they have that authentic context of here, this is an EpiPen. And I attended a training where a school nurse gave expired EpiPens to staff and had them jab a grapefruit to activate the injector. So they actually were familiar with that experience and so, yeah, an EpiPen, I think, is valid for about a year, and then they need to be disposed of. So that was an idea that the school nurse came up with. And staff appreciated it, right? It kind of demystified things, and they were familiar then. You want to document when Bruce shows symptoms, the time, and you also want to document the time that the EpiPen is administered. And here's a trick that a school nurse shared with me. She said, have somebody take a marker and write on the child's hand or on the lower arm, the time that the EpiPen was administered. Because as the child is transferred to the care of EMS, there, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff going on, right? A lot of panic, kind of just a high stress adrenaline situation. Um, you kind of forget to write down the time, or if you wrote it down, it might not transfer with Bruce. Also very proactive and thoughtful measures in mitigating potential bullying. Um, having opportunities for Bruce's classmates and for teachers to ask questions about, well, what is an allergy? And you know, what would be the symptoms? And what is an EpiPen? What does it do? And to have Bruce also be put in a role of self-advocacy. We had more about school safety this week. And as the director of pupil services, you have an important role to ensure that instruction devices and drills are inclusive. And there sometimes is nobody else who will advocate or pause to consider the value of safety measures. There's a lot of momentum just to go along with things. Vendors will sell things to school. And, you know, we saw it in this week's PBS videos. To be a safety vendor, uh, there isn't a certification for that. There isn't a license. And products that come to market don't have to go through trials. They don't have to uh, first be tested for you know, students with disabilities. You have a big role in this because there might not be anybody else who is taking the perspective of, okay, student with um, anxiety, student with autism, um, you know, how are they going to interface with these things? How can we think about that? So we make smart decisions up front. That K-12 counseling scope and sequence document is a dynamic asset. So make sure that you download it and I would encourage you to use it in your district, have it informed by students and staff, present it to the school board. That's something that you want, especially areas of pupil services, bullying, harassment, mental health. Week six, shout outs. Well, there were many. Julie shared that in her high school, there were three drills in one week, uh, an evacuation, a lock in and a lock down. So how do we lower the anxiety for students and staff 
and what input are we gathering directly from students as opposed to staff observations of students? You know, staff saying, oh, the students are handling this well, or the students seem anxious. Okay, that's a staff perception, but what are the students feeling right now? And how do you do that uh, relief valve? What is, what is the way to, to remove some of this uh, global anxiety and stress on that student body, almost like a pizza party? I don't know what it is, but it's talking and having the students inform that staff and the principal, because that is a lot. And especially it's all bundled in a greater context of a pandemic and now a, a war and all of these things uh, coming across TV of, of uh, potential you know conflict and things like that. So uh, Julie also had her set of questions for the school attorney, and she included a question about well, she had a couple of questions centered on this. When is a student considered their own person? I thought that was a great question. And we had it with this week's case study, right? The, the, with Bruce, when would Bruce be considered his own person or basically that he would be competent to identify if he was having an allergic reaction and to administer his own EpiPen, right? Or maybe a student that would administer insulin on their own. When are they identified as their own person? What are the criteria in place to do that? How do you document that as a school? Because, right, it's going to be student by student, but there has to be some process for doing that. And I don't know what that is, right? So that's why we have these questions that would be presented to an attorney. Moretta wrote about the emphasis going on in her school district on active shooter drills and noting that they take a lot of time at training. But she said, you know, we need this awareness for other potential events. So I see that too. I see schools put a lot of time into active shooter or intruder drills and very little time into tornado drill, um, into power outage, whatever it could be, other scenarios which are very plausible. And I shared a story in my response uh, that it was Spooner Middle School in November of 2021. There was an epoxy-like smell in the school and more than two dozen staff and students were evacuated out of the school and received medical treatment. Kay wrote, we need to talk to students and get their perspective on the culture and climate of the school. Adults can make assumptions, but often student perception is much more accurate. Yes, yes, um, I agree. And when you talk with students, right, you're, you're going to get more accurate information because it's from the students. And it also is validating to the students. Oh, I'm important now. The staff want to know what I'm thinking. And you make inroads into that youth code of silence. So absolutely. Um, too many times we catch ourselves saying, this is what they're thinking, or this is what they're feeling, or this is what they're doing instead of them, the youth, the students, right, to inform their own system. Here's what I'm feeling. Here's what I'm perceiving. And these are the types of things, too, I would recommend that you're sharing out with your school board and your administration that this is what you're doing. You're being informed by the students, not solely by observations of the adults. Tim asked, okay, here was one of our questions for the attorney. Tim asked, are superintendents worried that there might be some liability for buying or not buying a safety device, even if it is ridiculous? All right, and I've seen some ridiculous devices, I guess, well-intentioned, but I have seen some very strange things in my, <laughs> in my time. And then, you know, you ask the question, uh, where did you test this? And you find out your school is kind of the test site if you if you buy it. Right. Like so um, that's a good it's a great question. So, again, Tim is asking, is this liability? Are the superintendents um, afraid they're going to be to be sued if they don't do these things or if something happens and they didn't do these things, will they be uh, found uh liable. In my perception of this, and again, I'm not an attorney, but I, I think this is how it would be framed out. This is what I would expect from uh, an attorney to kind of go down these, these paths. But it, it, this comes down to selling the perception of safety. So it's understanding that when you invite vendors into your school building or you go to these conferences, right, and the vendors are paying a few thousand dollars for their booth, and 
you know, they're, they're trying to sell you things. It's always this very emotional appeal. And, you know, you have to you have to ask. You have to ask the questions of tell me how this was developed. Like who gave input to it? Um, where was a pilot site? Tell us about your trials. And when you ask the question, tell us about your trials, I usually hear a response from vendors, well, here it's in 308 school districts. And I'm like, well, that's not a trial. That's just where it's at. I wanna know the trial. Like how did you find out where the weaknesses were and tweak it and get the input from students with disabilities or students with anxiety or where? So you wanna make sure that your site isn't just a site where this product is. And then it's kind of in a uh, de facto like research location, right? They're gathering it while you're using it. Um, so it's this perception. I think it's just overwhelming perception. And I had in one of my PBS presentations, a slide of a, I believe it was a principal or could have been the superintendent who went inside a bulletproof igloo that was being sold by a vendor. And then people started to shoot their guns at the igloo while he was inside of it. And then when they were done, he opened up the hatch and he jumped out and he's like, I'm fine. Well, of course, everybody watching that was like, these things work. And the district bought several of them and put them inside of classrooms. And I did have a picture of that. So it took up about a third of the classroom. And now I even think of too, if you're a kid and you know, you've got this, this uh, igloo, your bulletproof igloo in your classroom, boy, that sends a, a anxiety filled message to you that, you know, well, you're not really safe at school here. We have to go into this, this shelter, which also didn't double as a tornado shelter or anything else. So vendors know if they have an audience that they can be very dramatic. But when you start digging into uh, the, in some t cases, you'll find that, right? Some things they'll have that information for you. It'll be vetted. You can say, where's the location? This is in place. You can talk to people. Yeah, I don't think it's liability as much. Um, I think it is much more the fact that it's it's an environment right now where the vendors are getting better and better at selling you know these things to school districts and school districts look and they see social proof another district that has it so if they have it well we assume they probably did their research on it so you know we're going to just put it here we're vetting that they did their due diligence Alyssa, a set of questions for the school attorney included can a student be removed from special education services due to too many absences? School attendance is an exclusionary factor for initially receiving services. So would that remove a student from special education or not? Along with that, what is the role of the team to assist that student if they are not sick and just missing school? So, all right, another great question. All of these are, are great questions. So. Yeah, so the the as you're sitting down with the attorney and having, you know, this it's saying at what point do we stop the IEP goals because the student isn't coming to school or it's so sporadic that we can't document progress toward a goal because they're just not here. Um, so where do we change and focus on attendance? Like how, put our resources into attendance. Like how do we how do we make that pivot? And, you know, what does that look like legally, too? Is, is there something where, you know, if we're trying to reconvene an IEP and the parents aren't showing up for the IEP, um, you know, we're coming up with a plan, but the child isn't being present, do we say, you know, we are going to discontinue, you know, the IEP until a time when you're, you know, able to commit to coming to, to school and to attendance? At that time, we can you know, we will reconvene the IEP and make sure that it's in place and current, but is there a point? And I remember in my career, we had some instances where that did happen. We worked with school council. I don't know the specifics with it, but we did have some instances where we discontinued uh, service. Tiffany asked, how much information can you share with regular education teachers about a disability? So yeah, it's, it's good. So how much information can you share. Um, again, uh, I don't know one of one of, and of course, I'm not the attorney here, but I had a situation where a teacher, regular education teacher was very determined to know the medications that ch the child was receiving. I want to know what meds. And then 
there wasn't really any need for the, the teacher to know that in the, the schedule. Uh, there wasn't going to be this adverse reaction if the child didn't have medications. And, and the thought uh, among kind of the school staff was the teacher was going to you know, do their own research on the medications and maybe use that um, in a discussion of, of why the student wasn't reaching performance goal. It was, you know, because of the medication or something. But that was something there was no compelling need to to share that information. So that whole practice of asking the attorney and, you know, you can just find out from, you know, the four questions that you put together and we aggregate all of the questions. But that is a very helpful process to coalesce some of the, the things that happen on a periodic basis that you really, you know, want to codify down a, a process. And you want to make sure that you're you're doing something that uh, is going to be compliant with your Board of Education policy and then also the applicable laws. I thought everybody did a terrific job with that. I mean, there were very keen observations and statements uh, you know, provide it. So the attorney would be both busy and exhilarated because very thoughtful. They'd be like, hey, this district is really looking ahead. This this people's service director. Yes. So all of you did a great job on that. You know, I had one question. So I would ask the attorney, how might a school develop cut criteria for an esports team? I just found out that another school in Wisconsin, I believe it's Kadat, is adding esports for the upcoming year. I think that's great. Actually, Viterbo University is adding esports for fall. So, will there be esports that will also be a part of the WIAA? And will there be esports that will have a cut criteria list? Only so many people on a, a team. And if that happens, like how do you how do you develop that for esports? Um, so, I I want to know that from a pupil services standpoint. I think I'd also have a question, what impact might this have on Title IX? Because as far as reporting out uh, for participation in sports by by gender, that really wouldn't be here necessarily for esports. So I'm excited about esports and I think there's going to be a lot of new questions coming up on esports. And also, would your athletic code of conduct apply for esports? I think it would. So um, but yeah, excited esports. Where was that 30 years ago when I was playing Madden football in college? So I guess I missed out. Week seven, looking ahead to week seven in Moodle. This is your final week for discussion questions. We cover abeyance agreements. Abeyance agreements are not codified by law. Uh, they can contribute to discrimination. For example, if they're applied repeatedly to certain students, you're not creating those behavioral records. They're just kind of vanishing, right? So the abeyance agreement could be separating that student from services that would be aimed at reducing whatever is causing those actions for the students. So abeyance agreements go by different names, pre-expulsion, right? That's kind of one of the common ones. Um, so you'll see these things will be in board policy and they'll look very official and all of that. But um, they are, once you dig into them and you try to go back to the actual legal footing for these, uh, it just isn't strong at all. So not that there isn't a time and a place for abeyance agreements, but habitual use or kind of just uh, a regular default use of these abeyance agreements um, can really contribute to an environment of, of discrimination uh, against uh, students because, again, these records aren't being generated, services aren't being matched to the student. Uh, if you go in and, and type abeyance agreement, you can find a lot of them uh, that's usually a page long, right? The student will attend school and the student will follow rules. And after uh, 60 days, if they do that, then, you know, the um, violation of code of conduct will be expunged from the record. Disability self-advocacy. So you're going to meet Savannah from Toma and Dave from the Wisconsin School for the Blind. And you'll have a discussion question uh, specific to that. But how about students doing videos, doing presentations about uh, disability or, you know, 504 or mental health or anxiety or things like that and their own experiences? Um, how do you feel about that or staff? 
uh, what are some benefits? What are some drawbacks? What would be some considerations for doing that? I was thinking too about, right, Bruce. I mean, as Bruce was got to be older, he could if do a presentation on what it's like to have a severe peanut allergy and his experiences as as somebody um, you know who deals with that every day or would there be reasons to not do that so just to kind of take both sides of that upload your FEMA course completion certificate by March 12th keep it with you because you'll definitely want to um, make that available when you are applying for your director of pupil services position in the syllabus weeks six and seven are combined so what's in there and what I covered is the same that I covered last week. Read chapters 18 and 28 in School of Airs and be ready because we'll be kind of talking about that when we have our final exam phone call. And I will post the sign up for that in about two weeks. That will be starting in April. So don't worry about it now. I'll have a lot of times out there. If none of those work for you, we'll figure out something that will. And you do have the option to also submit the written paper. There are no reflective teaching annotations for the remainder of course. So once we get through week seven, we enter the research module. And that's the time then to focus on your final project. So you've done a wonderful job. Again, your learning team assignments have individually been returned to you. The grade book is updated through week five and dun dun dun. Everything is uh, is going well. So thank you and have a terrific week. Hey.